This is a uh, employment seminar in the name of Lord Wedderburn of Charlton, who was a greatly respected former colleague of Chambers, who died last year. Uh, he was, of course, probably the greatest Labour lawyer who's ever lived. Why the Alison Weatherfield Foundation? Um, Alison was a brilliant employment lawyer who died prematurely last year. The princely sum of £2,500 has been uh, uh, donated uh, by those attending this evening and we are still counting, so we're particularly grateful to you. We'd like to get underway now with our seminar uh, above the parapet, which explores the topic of whistleblowing in the light of the new legislative <laughs> developments in this area. Uh, we all have an interest um, in people uh, blowing the whistle where they see wrongdoing, uh, because the um, parliamentary debates um, which led uh, to the passing of the um, Public Interest Disclosure Act, uh, which was then a private member's bill brought in by uh, the Conservative rebel MP Richard Shepherd, um, talked about um, uh, the scandal of the, the pension scandal, the Maxwell pension scandal, um, Piper Alpha, uh, the Clapham Rail disaster, Zeebrugge, and so on. Um, all of these disasters um, led to a consensus of, of opinion, uh, which led to the introduction uh, of the Act. The intention was not to introduce this as an employee rights measure. It was an act to protect uh, individuals who made uh, disclosures of information in the public interest. I'm going to look at uh, three particular areas and three cases where um, the, the way this uh, whistleblowing legislation worked in practice was criticised. The first one um, that Jenny's just pulled up there is this case of Parkins and Sodexo, probably very familiar to, to you all. Um, this was a case where the, uh, that opened the gateway, if you like, for the use of, of the legislation uh, in uh, an individual's self-interest rather than necessarily being in the public interest. That opened the door, as we all know, to potential claims uh, that aren't necessarily anything to do with the public interest um, and uh, cunning lawyers using whistleblowing, protected disclosures of bolt-on to ordinary unfair dismissal claims so you can avoid the statutory cap, you can um, avoid qualifying period of employment, you can apply for interim relief. And um, that was subject to uh, criticism and we can see that in the, in the debates um, around the uh, Enterprise and Regulatory Reform um, Act uh, that came into, into being this year. Uh, the second area I want to look at is um, the fact that the, uh, there was arguably inadequate protection for genuine whistleblowers. The second area I want to look at is um, the fact that the, uh, there was arguably inadequate protection for genuine whistleblowers. So too much protection for non-genuine whistleblowers, not enough for genuine ones. And this is the case of uh, Fessett and others versus NHS Manchester. Uh, all about uh, to what extent is an employee uh, protected from detriment, from bullying, harassment uh, by uh, co-workers. So these nurses are left worse off having raised uh, concerns genuinely in the public interest, but they have, uh, they're the ones that are redeployed or, or out of pocket, um, and they're the ones without a remedy under the Employment Rights Act. So, so hardly an incentive to, to, uh, to raise concerns, hardly um, uh, helping encourage a culture of, of people raising concerns in the workplace. And the final case is um, that of street and Derbyshire unemployed workers. The Court of Appeal felt that good faith, um, it means more than just thinking uh, what you're saying is reasonably true or doing it honestly. There has to be something uh, akin to it being in the public interest. And certainly, if your ulterior motive, in it, your predominant motive is an ulterior one, then you're not making these disclosures in good faith. And uh, that was something that was specifically uh, criticised and picked up on by Dame Janet Smith, who was uh, uh, in charge of the Shipman Inquiry, you'll all, all recall. And she recommended this additional hurdle of good faith be removed from the whistleblowing legislation in order to encourage uh, more disclosures 
uh, so that even people with mixed motives uh, will come forward and uh, uh, not be afraid to make disclosures. So I'll just hand back to Jenny. What do they do about it? Um, well, the um, Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Act uh, made five main changes to the Employment Rights Act on whistleblowing. Um, brought in an addition of an overarching uh, public interest uh, test uh, to the existing definition of a qualifying disclosure, um, removed the requirement uh, for good faith, um, but, thirdly, um, uh, brought in an ability for a tribunal to reduce compensation um, uh, as a result of a protected disclosure um, which is found not to have been made uh, in good faith. Um, has extended the meaning of worker uh, for the purposes of whistleblowing provisions um, and has introduced a primary liability uh, for co-workers or co-agents um, and a vicarious liability uh, for employers. Um, so it's, a, it's sought to address, the changes are sought to address uh, the uh, problems arising from the case law that Victoria has just outlined. The big question is what is the public interest? Um, could it be, for example, in the public interest uh, to, uh, raise a, a, to make a disclosure about a potential um, breach of the contractual uh, terms and conditions for a large workforce. Um, I don't know, public sector pensions, for example. What has been removed, so what you don't see on the slide, um, is the requirement of good faith. Um, so, now, the disclosure can be made maliciously. It can be made... Uh, because of personal antagonism. It can be made because the worker wants to undermine the commercial credibility um, of the employer. There is still a consensus that it is in the public interest to have protection uh, for whistleblowers at work. Who can claim? Well, employees and uh, workers uh, can claim. Of course, we have Section 43K uh, of the ERA, which uh, provides for wider categories of person, and that includes those introduced or supplied to do that work by a third person, so that's, broadly speaking, um, agency workers, provided that the terms are substantially determined not by him but the person for whom he works. That helps out self-employed contractors, uh, home workers, um, and it may indeed also help people who um, have their own um, service companies. Um, the EAT had a think about this topic uh, this year in a case called Sahail and Hart's Urgent Care, which was a case about uh, a GP working for an out-of-hours service. Um, the other case which has been considered recently, which no doubt you've heard of, is that of Ms. Uh, Bates van Winkelhoff and Clyde and Co., in which... Uh, a couple of years ago now, the EAT concluded that she, uh, as an LLP member, was a worker for the purposes of Section 43K. Around this time last year, the Court of Appeal overturned that decision on the basis that uh, a member of an LLP should be treated in the same way as a member of a partnership. What Woodward left undecided and what was considered this year uh, in the EAT in a case called Onyango and Barclay, a case... Uh, of um, uh, Joe Mambella of these chambers, um, was whether the Act covers not only post-termination detriment, but also post-termination disclosures. So can an employee obtain protection if they say, the employer I used to work for has done something and made a disclosure about that? The one group which is not included in all of this is job um, applicants. The Act provides for those who worked, uh, work or have worked, so it protects your present employment, it protects in relation to past employment, but it doesn't protect in relation to future employment. The EAT went on to think about what a deliberate failure to act means, because the board said it's only a deliberate failure to act if there's an obligation to act uh, and that it hasn't been done. And again, the EAT said no. If there's a power to act, an ability to act, uh, and a choice uh, is available to the employer whether or not to do so, um, that will amount to a deliberate failure. That's a very fact-sensitive question from case to case, and it's on that basis that it wasn't struck out and the usual words of, of warning were given by the EAT that tribunals should be slow to strike out cases which uh, are inevitably going to be fact-sensitive. Of course, whistleblowing isn't a, a European part of our legal system. 
Uh, it hasn't come from an EU directive. But that doesn't mean that the Human Rights Convention can't apply. The European Court has confirmed Article 10 does apply in circumstances where the employment relationship is governed by private law, partly because of the state's obligation to protect the right of freedom of expression. That's a, a, a Spanish case called Fuentes Bobo. What they were discussing was the, uh, were the problems in, in bringing and defending whistleblowing claims and, and why people were motivated to, to bring them, uh, because they're bringing a lot more of them. About three quarters of them are settled or withdrawn. That there's a high settlement rate, and when they actually, those that actually reach a final hearing, only about a third of those are successful. The average award is about 58,000. That's a little bit skewed by two or three hefty awards, but it's still comfortably about three times as much as the average award for sex and race discrimination claims, which are also a little bit skewed themselves. Like in discrimination case, cases, the tribunal can't even make recommendations. And so the claimant who wants to have their, uh, wrong, the, their, the wrongdoing investigated and something happened as a result of that is met by a tribunal that really just wants to look at causation and how much money flows from that. It is probably important these days, isn't it, to reassure the employee um, within a settlement agreement that whatever they sign, they are not precluded from blowing the whistle. But I can see why one might want to reassure the uh, employer that um, if they do, it's, you know, it's nothing they haven't heard. But, but I can't see that that's going to tie the employee down, I don't think. I think the, the drafting, um, to me, seems to reflect um, a real desire to maintain a consensus on this. So there's, there's real give and take on it. And the problem with consensus, as everybody knows, is it's a, um, everybody loses um, outcome. One of the concerns that we had um, was when you're looking at improper behaviour and undue pressure that the parties can apply on each other to force them into a settlement agreement, um, was that employees um, might uh, use the threat of um, d public disclosures uh, to force the employer into um, a settlement agreement. Um, so, but while we had that concern, we, we then recognised, particularly in terms of the, public, the climate we have at the moment in the, the uh, public sector, um, that, uh, of course, an employee must have the right to do that and must have the right, in a sense, to threaten um, to make public disclosures. Um, and uh, so, talking of woolly language, um, I'm afraid when you see the kind of the, the compromised position that you have in the ACAS code on that, I mean, it is reflecting, again, that sort of buffeting uh, between recognising that it could be misused um, and, and shouldn't be. Finally, can I invite you to express your thanks to our excellent panel of speakers. <laughs>